cedo. Você fica à vontade, Mary. Eu fico aqui do standby. Não, não. Eu fiz uns notes aqui, que eu, eu escutei a entrevista dele em espanhol. Meu espanhol não é bom, mas dá para entender. Sim. Sim. I think we're live. Hello, everyone. Let me know if, we, if you can hear me. Uh, we're going to have uh, Andre uh, from Sao Paulo. We're also going to have uh, Clive on. We're waiting for Clive. He should be on soon. Um, can you guys hear me? Let me know. I'm a little later than usual. Rudy's here. There he is. Hey, Rudy. <laughs> I think he's going to jump off or not. No, he's going to lie down. Yeah, they can hear me. So today we're going to talk about what's happening in Argentina, not because we believe, you know, Argentina is going to solve everything and because we have an interest, a uh, particular interest in Argentina. I, I think for me, uh, the particular interest is in um, their president elect because he seems to be more of an economist than a politician. And I think he's a bre breath of sh fresh air. And uh, I know there's a lot of speculation. A lot of people saying, oh, no, he's a globalist. He's going to, you know, do what the bankers want. But I, I think we need to listen to the man before, uh, because you're going to see in the mainstream media uh, a lot of uh, fallacies they're going to write about him. And why do I think that that is so? Well, because he's such a contrarian thinker, a little bit like me, and I'm not like bigging myself up. that some people don't understand what he's talking about. Um, maybe you have, a, 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 you know, a, an opinion on that, Andre. Well, uh, it appears Millet is a libertarian, which is uh, a big deal. Uh, people claiming it's the first time ever a libertarian makes it to the presidency. Uh, he's from the Austrian school, hardcore Austrian school. Uh, which is what people want, what people need, because they've seen what Keynesian economics can do. So he's the right man for the right time, whether he will be able to, uh, you know, implement his full agenda uh, is yet to be seen, but he was uh, elected convincingly. He's got support and uh, yeah, we shall see. Yeah, someone said here, uh, Andre, a uh, new president of Argentina is going to Washington, uh, see what he says after that. I, I listen, we're going to talk about the interview that I listened to. Uh, he was interviewed by two, I think it's a big program in Argentina, two guys at the same time. And he said that uh, he's going to have to negotiate with the IMF and he's going to show the IMF Uh, his plan for, you know, cutting the size of government, bringing inflation down. And of course, that's going to take, uh, it's going to take a, at least a couple of years to have an effect. Uh, what's your view on that? There's a lot of, you know, prior to the election, everyone was saying, oh, he will never be elected. And now that he's elected, everyone's saying, oh, he's a globalist. He's a World Economic Forum guy. But from listening to him and the way he thinks, I, I think, uh, Yeah, unless he's a big liar, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think he's he could be the real deal. Uh, look, uh, I think he he has a lot of leverage at Washington right now. And I, I would like to elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, it's either uh, Washington helping uh, them dollarize. So there might be some... Uh, upfront money from Washington, because once you get rid of the central bank, by definition, and we'll go a little further into the details, but once you get rid of the, the central bank, uh, fiscal responsibility becomes very hard to miss. It can happen. There can be still corruption. There can be, uh, there can still have some misuse of funds, but you cannot print to plug in these holes. So yeah. it's still advised for you to uh, get rid of your central bank and, 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 and think that you're going to get away with fiscal largesse for any time, uh, yeah. any, any, any time at all. Yeah. That being said, I think, now I'm going to go a little bit into geopolitics. Uh, I think that the alternative for Washington 
is for them to fall into the hands of China and Russia. Yeah. Which was about to happen under the old administration. So he's been very, uh, very vocal about the, he doesn't want to team up with the communists. He's pro Israel. He wants to be with the with the U.S. Yeah. I'm not sure to what extent he's being fully honest on that, but yeah. he's using this rhetoric to make sure Washington, you know, allows him to implement what he needs, and he will need some support, yeah. financial support. Hi, Clive. Hello. Good evening, Mario. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Great. Good, yeah, good. Nice to see you. Yeah, we were just talking. Good evening, about... Andre. <laughs> Hi. Good to see you, Clive. Yeah, we we're just talking about good to see. Uh, Argentina, and uh, maybe you could um, give uh, your initial opinion on the new president elect. I mean, prior to the election, the final final round, people were saying, "Oh, he will never get elected." And now that he's elected, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, he's just a globalist, and he's just gonna, you know, uh, cave in." So I'm not sure if you have looked into him. Uh, so what's your opinion? And I just want to, before you uh, start, to tell the viewers that I'm not here to, like, big up Argentina or anything. <laughs> I I don't have uh, any, like, uh, preference for countries or anything. It's just that I, I think it's really interesting that we have, like, a the first libertarian free market Austrian president <laughs> ever elected. He seems to be a bit of a crazy guy, a bit like Donald Trump. Uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Uh, I mean, he's uh, more of the sort of person who gets onto uh, the social media and makes a, uh, a big impression. And I think the population as a whole uh, kind of like that. I think that the world, the way the world is going and social media is playing a bigger part. And uh, this guy, he's outspoken, he's brash. Uh, to some extent, he's outrageous. Uh, the population of Argentina have literally had enough. They've got uh, very, very high inflation. I think it's about 140%, but it's going on 200% very soon. And I think the people, they can't save money. Uh, they see no future with the uh, political situation they've got, and they're ready for a change. And uh, he's come from, come out of nowhere and offering them uh, the promise, at least, of changing things. And uh, I think the main thing that the, the Argentinians kind of like is the promise that he will dollarize the country. Um, now, that is, in my view, quite uh, tricky to do because you've got uh, sort of three levels to deal with. You've got the currency in circulation, you've got the bank deposits, and you've got the central bank liabilities, uh, which would all have to be dealt with differently. And each one, each of those would have their own set of problems. But, you know, I, I think it would be great if he could do it. Um, maybe he'll get some help from another outside source from the IMF or from the World Bank or from the United, United States government in some way because they're, they're going to like him. I, I, I've got the feeling they're going to like him. Uh, because he is a capitalist, um, so yeah, I I think he's a uh, he, he's a breath of fresh air for Argentina, and I have heard uh, a number of people thinking or, or saying that everything's about to change in Argentina. Maybe if he can pull it off, and it might be an interesting country to go and live in now. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, some people are saying that he's uh, in the World Economic Forum, and I, I've actually looked into that a, a month or so ago. He attended a, an economic conference in Panama in 2014 for the World Economic Forum. So they took a picture of him and they still have him on, on the website. But I, I think at the time he, he hadn't looked into the Austrian school. So I, I'm not too sure he's a, a World Economic Forum guy. And um, what I wanted to talk about, Clive, uh, and, and what you said there, move to Argentina, that could be an interesting thing. Uh, even though I think I'm maybe now at my age, you know, but if you're in your 20s and 30s, it could be an interesting to do. Um, yeah, so I was listening to, uh, because my, you know, being originally from Brazil, uh, Spanish is very similar to Portuguese. And I'm going to share here, uh, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I listened to it. It's an interview he did here. Uh, with uh, and he's got his own YouTube channel. So if some of you speak Spanish, you can subscribe to Javier Mille. There you go, three hundred fifty thousand subscribers. It says Mille Unstoppable, uh, and I, I think uh, those voices or the two voices 
is like a popular Argentinian uh, news program. And he did an interview with these two guys. And, and I I took notes. So that's what we're going to look at uh, right now. And, and uh, the, one of the first things he said was that, and I'm, you know, uh, just to uh, clarify, I'm not it too much into politics. But in this case, we're going to look at it because him being a, a libertarian changes things. He's a bit of a Ron Paul. But he said, you know, the... Uh, the winning margin gives him a mandate. I think it was something like 55 to 45, which is true. And one of the first things he said I thought was interesting is the old Einstein saying that uh, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again it, and it never works, that's the definition of insanity. And that's how he described the Argentinian economy. So, uh, Andre, can you uh, talk a little bit about that? maybe um, being in Brazil and probably knowing a bit more about Argentina than we do. Look, uh, he's an outsider. The system is very entrenched at all levels of government. Government. So what I like about him, uh, about his chances to try and succeed is the fact that he, he doesn't negotiate. So once they started floating around rumors that the central bank would not be dissolved that you know there was some rethinking about how it's going to work he came out real quick to say that's non-negotiable and he doesn't mince with words so i think he's going to try something that has never been tried before which is zero tolerance and full power to the people in one of his interviews what most caught my attention was that he said the days where the Argentine people serve the government are over, never more. Now the government will have to serve the Argentine people. And he said that everyone within the government will have to live within their means. And, and you know, like I was telling you before we went on live, uh, once you remove the central bank, you remove the money printer. So you're gonna have to make out of your tax receipts, uh, you make out of, outside of the profits from the state-owned companies, and, and you make out, out of lenders who are willing uh, to lend you dollars that you will need to pay back in the future. So you take away the money printer, as I was saying, it, it's extremely difficult for run large deficits before everything halts. Uh, that being said, I was saying uh, there's $200 billion in the hands of Argentine citizens. They've been used to the dollar for decades on end. So, uh, you know, on that side of the equation, the Argentinas, they do have the dollars, except they will have to buy goods and services with those dollars, not as cheap as, you know, at the expense of the lower level population. So I think there's a good chance uh, we're going to see how entrenched uh, the system is, what can what can they try. But my guess, Mario, is if you take away uh, the central bank, I mean, it's like taking away, you know, their biggest weapon. Uh, you know, you take away the root cause of most of the problems in Argentina. He, he says he's going to do away with 75% of public servants, especially those who were, uh, who were politically appointed. He said that as far as career servants are concerned, he's going to reshuffle the cabinet for people who are career servants to be useful at other areas. I think he's going to end up with every single ministry except for six, he mentioned them, uh, interior, uh, exterior, and a handful of others. So we shall see. Uh, basically, that's my major takeaway. He doesn't seem to be willing to negotiate. He doesn't seem to be willing to give him an inch. I think from experience, we can, we can say that once you start negotiating, once you give them uh, inches, they will take the whole thing. Yeah. They will smell the weakness and they will just, you know, steamroll you. One of the, you. 
sorry, one of the viewers just said that Congress, uh, he doesn't have control of the Congress, but, you know, after getting, you know, almost two thirds of the vote, it might be, can they have an election for Congress? How, how do you think he'll uh, cope with that? Look, I'm not an expert in Argentine politics. I don't know to what extent he needs Congress to approve the end of the central bank. Uh, I don't know to what extent he needs Congress for certain measures he needs to take, such as, you know, getting rid of uh, ministries and stuff. But the fact that he's got a relevant voting uh, behind him, uh, some of these congressmen are going to uh, have to deal with it. And yeah, decide... because they, they might think, oh, if I don't do this, I'm going to lose the next election, right? Yeah. Again, I, I wish I knew a little more yeah. of the details. To what extent can he get rid of the central bank uh, without Congress approval? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm not into, I, I understand a lot about Brazilian politics, a bit about US, yeah. but to be honest, uh, how you how you put these laws into 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 work in Argentina, I'm not so sure. But I I I, I, I might say again, the Argentine people is behind him. Yeah. Argentina is a, a much smaller country. I think Congress is going to have to play ball because otherwise yeah. the people are going to, you know, demand a high price. We'll see. Yeah. Clive, any. What's your view on uh, Milley um, and the central bank, and uh, also like uh, like he, he uses the term the chainsaw. He wants to cut size. Yeah, of I saw that. Chainsaw. Uh, I I think he's going to face opposition from the Congress, uh, but to get his way, he'll probably uh, organize some referendums, and then as the people vote for what he wants, which I think they will. Um, then he'll be able to present the result of those referendums to the Congress and they will find the, their hands more or less forced by him saying, this is the will of the people. Uh, so I think uh, that's probably the way he'll get some of these uh, things through Congress. Um, as for the central bank, I don't think it's the most brilliant idea to get rid of the central bank. Um, I think, you know, dollarization, that's quite a good idea, but you need to keep a central bank um, just to manage internal banking affairs. And at some point, they're going to want to de-dollarize, perhaps 10 years from now, if they if they dollarize. And the only way you could de-dollarize is if you've got a central bank ready to go when the time comes. So I think, think probably it may be a good idea to keep the central bank around, but um, have them play a role in the dollarization that he wants to put in place. Um, as I said, it's going to be quite difficult to dollarize because Argentina does not have the dollars at the moment. And if they suddenly declare that everything is in dollars, there will be a run on the banks because what's going to happen, people are going to run straight down to the banks and say, I'll have, I'll have, I will have, I had pesos, now I want dollars. Give me my dollars, please. And of course, the banks won't have it. So uh, they'll have to manage that very, very delicately. I think it can be done, uh, but it would require a lot of thought and planning and also some restrictions and rules uh, as they get it, as they manage their way through it. Yeah, I mean, um, hopefully, you know, they will get rid of the central bank eventually. Maybe they might need it. But one thing he said, because um, the two reporters there, they said, you know, why do you want to get rid of the central bank? Are you still going to do it? And he said, that's the wrong question to ask. He said, the question to ask is, why do we need a central bank? And he noted that the central bank of Argentina was created um through an act of Congress in 1935, and he had all the numbers. He said pre the central bank, inflation was only 0.9%. And then 10 years after the central bank was created, inflation was running at six. <laughs> and what's really amazing is that uh, from uh, when the central bank was created to 1991, inflation averaged 219% a year, which is huge. Yeah, but I, I will give Clive, you know, uh, like, uh, how can I say, I will like uh, kind of kind of agree with you about the central bank, even though I don't like it, because uh, I, I've looked at the Bank of England um, inflation calculator and from and I'm going to bring it up here uh, from, let's see, 
I'm going to share it. Uh, I mean, I, what I'd like to say about this sort of yeah. bank, it's 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 not that I'm uh, I, I'm not against the central bank itself, but I'm against the fact that central banks in general use their power to print money and yeah. thus defraud the population of their yeah. buying power through inflation. Uh, yeah. That's what I don't like about central banks. Yeah, I, I think they should uh, make sure that they limit the power of the central bank, because if you look here at the Bank of England inflation calculator from 1814 to 1914, and I took those dates because 1814 was the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and then 1914 was the beginning of World War uh, I, uh, inflation average minus 0 0.4 a year, and England had a central bank. But like you said, Clive, they, they weren't allowed to, to print money out of thin air. Every pound had to be, you know, if you went to uh, the Bank of England or any other bank, they, they had to redeem a, a pound note in a sovereign. So, but the problem with, with having the central bank, is it's very tempting when there's a crisis, the government will, you know, a, a allow them to do that. So, yeah, that that's uh, that's the only problem. So... What about you, uh, Andre? How do you feel about the central bank? Because in Brazil, uh, I've looked into this. Uh, the central bank was only created in 1964. Well, uh, there are real world cases where there's no central bank. Uh, I have two examples here that I picked up from a, a think tank mentioning Hong Kong and Panama. Once you don't have the central bank, uh, those banks, those elected banks, uh, they perform certain tasks for the government. So you take away the money printer, everything else is handled by private banks. So that is one thing that uh, makes it possible for you to, uh, to operate without a central bank. And as I mentioned, we have two real life examples in, in Panama and Hong Kong. Uh, um, also, uh, also, is Ecuador? Has, I think has got no central bank, or am I thinking of? Um, I, I'm Salvador. not sure. I, Ecuador went through dollarization. I'm not sure they got rid of their. What central about bank. Singapore? Isn't it also called the Singapore Monetary Authority? Is it the same? It could be. Yeah. So there are there are real life cases where this is the case. Uh, just for for perspective, uh, catching up on on what uh, Clive said. Argentina is a uh, 600 billion uh, GDP, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and uh, 40 million people. Some say because of you know, their terrible uh, monetary policies throughout years, that the Argentines are already using the dollars for quite some time now. So it is rumored that Argentine individuals and, and corporations are holding up $200 billion worth of dollar currency, okay? What we've seen as of recently with the high rates of inflation in Argentina is the use of digital dollars, stable currencies in the form of USDT, which is uh, very good because just say back in the day in, in early 2000 during the Manon administration, you'd have to go to Washington and talk to the Fed and ask them to send physical dollars. Or you would have to go, the private banks in, in Argentina would have to go to their corresponding banks uh, uh, abroad in Miami and ask for physical dollars. You don't need to that, do that anymore. You can just convert them into uh, stable currencies, which are already widely adopted in Argentina. USDT adoption in Argentina is off the charts. People are already living. That's Tether, isn't it? Yeah, it, it runs on Tether. Yeah. yeah. So that's a stable currency. It's one for one. So I think USDT adoption in Argentina is going to go even higher. Uh, people are not going to have uh, difficulty uh, in going on with their lives. Uh, I think the only thing, and I'm, I'm going to get to Clive's point about uh, lack of dollars in a minute, but I think as far as day-to-day -day lives, uh, is not going to be way too traumatic. W what they've done in the past, Clive, 
is that they get rid of the central bank. Uh, some private banks start performing certain tasks on behalf of the government. The government has a monetary authority and he deals directly with private banks. Uh, that being said, uh, I took a look at the Central Bank of Argentina balance sheet. They have certain bank notes, which are uh, demand deposits. Those have to be converted to dollars as of immediately. They have enough currency for that. They have enough gold. I looked, they have a lot of gold. They have a lot of dollars. And that surpasses the amount of uh, immediate obligations that they have. So they can do good on those immediate obligations. Then you have the Lelikis, right, Mario? They have the yeah, T-bills. T-bills, the Argentinian T-bills, because Mille said that's a big problem. Yeah. No, but yeah, it is a big problem because they, they have a lot of those in their balance sheet. They have a lot of obligations, and those have to be converted to dollars. And from what I understand, uh, what would happen in day one is – they would set up uh, an exchange rate between the official rate and the blue rate, okay? Uh, I have the numbers here. Uh, they started back in 18, 2018, the peso was 19.6 per dollar. Fast forward to today, the official rate went to 350. Yeah, one dollar was three hundred was nineteen pesos. Now it's three fifty. But but that's really, but that's the official rate. Yeah, the, the that, blue rate is between it's bid nine ten. Yeah, offer nine sixty. Yeah. So one one might imply that the market rate, uh, the equilibrium rate today would be somewhere between nine ten and nine sixty. And I think uh, Millet said that he wants the market to determine. He doesn't want to set any rate. Because he's a and that's that exactly. So taking his words to the T, one what they're going to do is they're going to define a market rate, temporary market rate, and say somewhere between nine ten and nine sixty, which is the spread off bid off of, of the blue rate, and they're going to let it work for 90, 180 days of sorts, maybe shorter and see where the market uh, finds its equilibrium. And once this equilibrium is defined, that's when they're going to define this rate going forward, unlimited. Yeah. Uh, about the T-bills that they have in their balance sheet, uh, I guess they either have to find money from the IMF as a loan, and what can they offer the IMF or the US government or, or the World Bank, anyone who would be willing to lend them the dollars? So uh, would that be so they could uh, get rid of those uh, obligations? They sell them for dollars or something? They need to have an extra cushion of dollars with long-term obligations so they can get rid of these uh, T-bills that they have, uh, Argentina, the uh, peso denominated T-bills in their balance sheet. So what you do is you have these obligations in pesos. Uh, they mature over time. So you get a much longer and better terms from the IMF, the World Bank, or even Washington, you put them into your reserves. Now you have enough dollars to pay yeah. these local local obligations as they mature. Yeah. And I guess, and uh, sorry, so the way to get rid of those leaks is to cut the size of government so they don't have to keep issuing them to pay public. Uh, so that's... That why would the why would the IMF or Washington or or uh, you know the World Bank why would they lend money to Argentina now? He would come and say, "Look, I got rid of the money printer." Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. The, we've got a super chat here from Chris Conman. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, his question is: Once inflation is created, what determines where it will go? Why didn't it show up first in consumer prices in dot com bust era? or in 2008, before the stock market and real estate bubbles. Thanks. So he's, I guess he's indirectly asking about the Cantillon effect. Uh, Clive, do you want to give your opinion on that? Um, th there's always been a delayed effect with the printing of money because uh, in, uh, when you print money, it goes through several sets of hands. 
uh, and I'm being a bit cheeky here when I say it goes to the politicians, uh, then it goes to the in the stock market, and finally it ends up in the in the business the, the businesses who are uh, building the factories and the hands of the workers. Now that's a little bit cheeky because it's not quite like that, but um, it doesn't it doesn't hit the man in the street straight away. And therefore, prices aren't immediately pushed up. Uh, it takes its, it takes time for it to work its way through the system. And I think the question was sort of, if I've got it right, he's kind of asking uh, when they started printing money a lot, um, why didn't it uh, immediately push up prices back then? Uh, why are we why are we now seeing yeah consumer now? prices? Yeah. Sorry. Go yeah. So yeah, it's just basically there's a lag effect. It takes time for any money printing to work its way through the system. Yeah, do you have any idea why it went first into the financial? I think it went first into financial assets because interest rates kept going lower. What, what's your view, uh, Andrew? So yeah, I mean, so or, I mean, I just sorry, just kind of butt in one there. Yeah, uh, yeah. On, on that side, uh, what's happening is uh, the uh, as they stimulate the economy, uh, the central bank is buying the government bonds. And that's basically pushing the money into the economy, and someone somewhere is getting it. And uh, as they sell the bonds, um, uh, uh, well, the, as as someone gets that money, they're basically investing in whatever they can, which is the stock market to start with, the dot com. Yeah, Andre, what, how do you see it? I have a very uh, sanguine view about this uh, because I try to connect the dots, Mario, and. If you think about the dot-com bubble uh, where everything started, think about the internet was coming in and the advent of the internet becoming viral is extremely deflationary because everyone's productivity increases by a lot, okay? So this would allow them to print more money than usual so to capture the deflationary forces coming in from the advent of the internet. Think about what they're gonna do. I'm going a little bit off topic here, but think about what they're gonna do with money printing when AI drives the costs of everything to $5 an hour. You understand? Yeah. Uh, so it's they're going to capture all this deflationary uh, productivity to themselves. But going back to the bubble, going uh, from the bubble. So you had a deflationary force that allowed them to print without much uh, inflation. Uh, we had a bull market in bonds that was still going strong. And what you got with all that money printing until recently was lack of money velocity because this money was being printed, but he's, he was, th that money wasn't rushing to buy goods and services. That money was being, like Clive said, was being put with the stock markets, was being kept, uh, you know, in these very large pools without too much effect on the economy, especially because they were taking advantage of these productivity effects to keep uh, artificially low inflation because they matter with, uh, with the metrics, right? So you start, you know, a TV used to cost $10,000, now it costs $200. They rode that wave big time. What, what went wrong, and I think that's where their biggest mistake was, when we went on a lockdown where the entire world is producing zero, and you print like 40, 45% of, of all dollars ever printed <laughs> within that period, where nobody, where, where anyone, no one is producing anything. And then the Euro Central Bank went and did the same thing. You know, the Japanese did the same thing. The UK did the same thing. And once they opened the economy, you had shortages because of supply chain disruptions. You have a world that is on the verge of uh, mercantilism. You, they declared war because of global warming. They decided to declare war uh, on food and energy. And now <laughs> here we yeah. are. I mean. It's yeah. a, they created a perfect storm of sorts. You know, I cannot imagine what's coming next because, you know, this weekend we started to see uh, some cracks in the banks. Uh, I think something came out tonight. A $36 billion bank uh, went bust in China as we speak. So we'll see. We'll yeah. see. I would add uh, uh, that question about why the uh, 
uh, money printing or inflation didn't go into consumer prices uh, during the dot-com bubble or, you know, in the early 2000s. I think we need to add the WTO allowing China to join the WTO. Extremely that, deflationary. Yeah, that, that was, you know, because we got, you know, uh, the Chinese started producing a lot of goods uh, that were being exported to the US, to Europe, and uh, the and uh, with the uh, e interest rates going down, uh, even though people were losing jobs in the West, they're still able to borrow and spend. And, uh, and now, you know, with what happened after 2020 about the supply chain, this is all reversing and China is not, even though uh, I bought something today when I went to play golf, it was really cold, it was a mitt, to wear while you, you know, after you hit your shot and put it, it was made in China. So there's still a lot of Chinese stuff out there. So I, I think that helped as well. So hopefully, uh, Chris, that answers your question. Uh, another uh, thing that um, Millet talked about, and this is to do uh, with bricks. And, and I'm not going in order here because I, I've taken a lot of notes, but uh, he said that Argentina... Uh, will be aligned with the U.S., Israel, and the West, <laughs> and not communist or authoritarian regimes. But he said at the same time, which is really people have a difficult uh, time understanding this because he is a libertarian. He said businesses have total liberty, Argentinian business, to uh, you know to uh, transact with whoever they want. So he's saying. Uh, we're not going to like promote relations with China or Russia, but if Argentinians want to do business with them, it's it's fine with me. So, Clive, what do you, what do you think about that? I mean, it seems like people think that's really strange, but it, it, it's uh, it makes sense to me. Um, you know, he's a free market guy. Uh, he, he's an economist uh, by trading. And uh, he realizes that uh, when you have no restrictions on who you trade with or barriers to trade, uh, it's good for both sides. Yeah. Andre? I agree 100%. Uh, he's yeah. being smart. There's a big uh, geopolitical dispute uh, around the world today between the BRICS plus and, 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 you know, uh, and the U.S. and Western Europe. So I think he's playing perfect. He's saying, look, I want to de-dollarize. I cannot antagonize with Washington because I'm going to need their help to, to lend me some money so I can do good on my local denominated obligations until, you know, things start to get into shape. But at the same time, because he's a libertarian, just like Clyde just said, he's not going to refrain from trading with China or Russia because that would be against the economy. So if, if you know, I was telling you before we went live, uh, Mario, uh, one way for him to have leverage with Washington to get the money he needs based on his fiscal responsibility going forward is to say, look, if you don't help me, I'm going to have to adopt the U1, the gold back U1 of sorts, you know? So I think Washington has no choice. They're going to have to help him dollarize and they're not going to be able to make sure he does, okay, I'll give you the dollars you want, but you cannot buy stuff from Russia. You cannot buy stuff from China. If, 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 you, if Washington, if the Biden administration does something like that, that's going to be very stupid from their part, extremely yeah. stupid, because then they're going to have to run to gold or so, of sorts. You know, yeah. I don't know. I, I, let's see how that works out, because, yeah, he's going to Washington. And the big question mark here is whether Washington is willing uh, to finance the transition for a country that is going to be a good uh, creditor, for a country who says he wants to align with the West, but if they decide they want everything, like, uh, you know, Washington has been doing this on a global scale, either you're with us or you're without us. Just ask Modi in India. Modi is not allowed to trade with everyone. He has to choose. If they do that to Argentina, I mean, we'll see. We'll have to watch. Yeah, yeah. Well, someone's asking uh, me, um, you might be able to help. What do you think uh, is uh, going to happen with Millet with gold flowing from west to east? Well, I personally think right now it's not really going to have a big impact, but it could. Uh, Andrea, you said that Argentina has relatively big gold reserves. 
I don't know out of my head because I was yeah. trying to look at the think yeah. tank paper that I was uh, reading before we had this this live. But yeah. they have some gold. They have gold, uh, not a ton of gold, but they have a decent amount of gold. I, I think some like maybe two tons of sorts. More than Canada. But, <laughs> Um, Canada has zero, so I everyone know. has. <laughs> you have more gold than Canada, Mario, I would say. Yeah. But but anyways, uh, I think that is not uh, really important right now because uh, he cannot adopt a gold standard with the little amount of gold that he has. Mm. But if if Washington were to... Well, let's talk about gold going from, from west to east. It's happening. There's no question about it. Gold is going for... Look, you see... 60, they have they've got 62 tons, nine and a half percent of all their foreign reserves, which is go. quite a good uh, proportion. I mean, if you look at the UK, we got 9.3 percent of reserves. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, but then again, uh, think about the following. Uh, my view about go gold going from west to east is that we're on the verge of having price discovery for gold, getting kicked out of the paper gold market in the West. And now China is going to do something that, you know, the banks who are short gold, they're not going to like. I don't know how that's going to play out, but I, yeah. I fear gold might rocket to the moon when that happens. I don't know how they're going to deal with that because, yeah, they've been suppressing the price of gold forever. It seems that Xi, knows, Xi Jinping knows about this. He needs to go back to, to offer a trade agreement that is, reasonably better than the debasing dollar. But I don't know to what extent this would affect Argentina. What I do know in, 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 in connection to this uh, gold going from, from, from west to the east is that, think about it today, uh, he might pick up the dollars he needs from Washington to make this transition. And then he got rid of the Argentina peso, but what if they start hyperinflating the dollar? That's another problem for yeah, the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, my point is, once the dollar starts to hyperinflate, I don't know, they can keep this party going for a long time in the US. Yeah. They can do a lot of things. They can raise interest rates to the moon. They can do financial repression and keep people attached to the US Treasury bonds. Uh, they can do a bunch of games to keep uh, you know, uh, the dollar afloat. Uh, but eventually hyperinflation will knock on the door. And then I think when that happens, Millet is going to have to think about it. Yeah. What does he do? You know, yeah, well, like everybody else. Yeah. One thing I, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, last year I went to a mining conference and I, I, I met, I had a meeting with like a, a mining uh, executive and they have uh, some mines in Argentina. And he was saying the problem with Argentina at the moment and and then was that it was really hard to uh, export the earnings outside Argentina so I have a feeling if uh, Millet is able to fix Argentina uh, in the next few years that a lot of uh, capital is going to flow into Argentina into the mining sector gold and other things and and yeah, gold gold is important, <laughs> and you all know that I I believe that gold is very important. But I think what Millet and I think Millet knows about it too, so gold and silver. But what he's trying to do first is fix the the you know the government uh, in terms of you know spending too much and also the central bank and its uh, you know liabilities and then you can think about those things you got to take one step at a time you can't just uh, say oh we're going to adopt a gold standard because it won't work because they they first need to fix their uh their house uh clive uh, i'll let you uh yeah okay um so i mean a couple, couple of things about the dollarization assuming they can get it through um argentina is uh, uh, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, an exporting country. It exports uh, com commodities, agricultural goods, and that's a completely different cycle, business cycle, from the United States. So uh, apart from the hyperinflation problem, which uh, Andre just referred to, um, while we're getting there, uh, Argentina will be to some extent swung around by 
the internal US uh, monetary policy as they try to manage their economy through interest rate cycles and things like that, uh, which may not be in line with what's good for Argentina. So that'll be something which they'll have to figure out how they're going to manage if they go dollarized. Um, mm-hmm. And I just want, just want to comment on another comment which we, you were talking about, uh, which was the flow of gold from uh, west to east. Uh, we've seen in the last three months that central banks have significantly increased their purchases of gold over and above the average of the last three years. It's about three times as much uh, on average over the last three months that have been bought by central banks. Now, it is only three months that I'm looking at, and uh, we'll see how the next three months go. But I think what's going on here is that this fear of something happening to the dollar, which might be a hyperinflation situation, is starting to increase around the world. And uh, other central banks don't know exactly which way the US and the Federal Reserve will play it and how it's going to play out. So they need to have a plan in case they need to move to a gold standard rapidly. Uh, because you know, if the dollar goes down, the whole world, all the currencies of the world go down at the same time. And those who've got the gold will be able to back their currency by with gold and keep going very, very rapidly. Um, so I think that's a that that's the reason why central banks are buying a lot of gold, because you know, if we have a new Bretton Woods agreement or something like that, those who've got the gold will call the shots, basically. Yeah, they'll sit, they'll be sitting at the table. If you don't have gold, you can't sit at the table. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, and- may, may I? Uh, yeah. On Clive's, to Clive's point, uh, it's very important to understand that in case the dollar starts to, uh, you know, debase real quick, Argentina might be in a good position as I see it, because they have hard assets. So they have, they're an agricultural powerhouse, they have mining, they have a lot of oil and gas. So as we were discussing earlier, once they get into fiscal discipline and they plug in a a short-term solution for their, to be dollar denominated uh, liabilities in in local T-bills, I would expect foreign investments to pour into Argentina for gold miners, for agribusinesses, for oil and gas, they can attract a ton of money. Argentina is an amazing country for a couple of reasons. They have a lot of uh, very, fer- the best lands in the world for agriculture and, and cattle. They have a lot of oil and gas, a lot of oil and gas, and they have a geography that is picture perfect. They have the, the but Rio de la Plata that, you know, crosses the entire country. So logistics and all kinds of hubs are extremely uh, cheap uh, for you to uh, develop in Argentina. No wonder they were the richest country in the world or one of the richest countries in the world in, in early in the 20, 20th century. To Clive's point, uh, what I find it when I think I like to think that when Millet says, "Look, uh, we're going to dollarize, but we're going to allow the public sector to trade with, with whomever they trade," I mean, if you have a, if you have a, if you're going to sell your agricultural commodities, uh, you must then know well whether you want useless dollars for it or you might choose something else. Cold. So when when push comes to shove. First of all, he's going to have to borrow dollars expensive because interest rates are at five and a half percent. But then he can attract foreign direct investments, uh, which is not interest. It's uh, equity investments in Argentina and, and, and better the profile of their liabilities there. Yeah? So once they start exporting their goods uh, out of Argentina, which was very difficult now, uh, Eventually, they might look at how they invoice these goods, and they might think that the dollar might not be uh, a good way to invoice them. But it's hard to tell. I mean, you understand my point? Uh, they, yeah. they might be, if the dollar debases to the moon, them having hard assets, free markets, and fiscal drip discipline, if they play their hands well, they might end up selling their commodities for some sort of gold. I, I, yeah. I, I'm a big advocate that the Eurozone is, is toast because they don't have hard commodities. The U.S. does. Western Europe doesn't. So I'm a big advocate that eventually 
uh, uh, Europe will have to adopt, at least for a certain portion of its currency, some kind of gold-backed euro, if not to be able to buy oil and, and food. And they might end up with those euros in Argentina, backed by yeah. gold. I mean, shall see. the European, like Germany, uh, France, Italy, those countries that they have supposedly uh, quite a bit of gold. So that could be an option for them. And, and uh, the Dutch are already calling for the, the gold standard, aren't they? Yeah, and they said they that could. That was funny. Gold. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, I mean, Germany, Italy, France, Netherlands have got a ton of gold. Uh, yeah. Great Britain has got very little. Yeah. Someone's asking you, if governments needed to back their currencies with gold, which country would be the best place to set the revalued level to gold to match their liabilities, China, US, or Russia? Well, I'll uh, answer it first and let you guys answer too. Uh, you know, officially the US has just over 8,000 tons. China and Russia only have officially over 2,000, but there's a lot of speculation that China and Russia have a lot more. And uh, it, I guess it depends. You know, the US has a lot of debt and their money supply is humongous. So I, I would say out of those three, China, uh, sorry, Russia would be in the best position. Uh, what do you think, Andre? And then Clive? Well, it depends on who you ask. My view is as follows. For you to uh, for you to debase the currency and and use gold, uh, people are going to get poor. So you have to give them something in exchange. So for example, if you have a lot of uh, a lot of currency floating around that is useless and it's caught up with inflation, uh, one way to fix the problem is to revalue your gold reserves to a certain price and declare that from here on, everything is backed by gold, which takes away the money printer of sorts. People are gonna be debased, but they will know that from then on, uh, the debasement is gonna stop. So the more gold reserves you have in relation to your money supply, uh, the easier it is for you to uh, you know, put this kind of arrangement in place. Whether they're willing to do that, uh, I don't know. I, I think a lot about Europe. I think Europe might want to have a financial repression through via CBDCs, programmable CBDCs, where you're going to have to stick your money with uh, low yielding uh, euro bonds of sorts. And they might issue some gold back euro for trade so they can access commodities that they don't have. I mean, who knows what they're going to do? What I do know is. Uh, the more gold reserves that you have in, in, in comparison to the amount of fiat that you need to back it by gold, the, the less is the problem for everyone involved. Mm. We've got a question here from Philippe Lewis, and thank you for the super chat. He says, uh, the utilization of debt allowed nations to leverage global influence that could not be done traditionally. That allowed businesses to sell products customers could not afford. How are debts ever going to be made whole if paid by other debts? What's the end game? So I think what he means by how are debts going to be made whole yeah, uh, under a non-gold standard, you can never pay off the debt because uh, the money is debt, so you have to keep issuing debt. Under a gold standard, you could extinguish that by paying in gold. So, Clive, I'll let you answer that. Uh, um, yeah, so it, it's quite true that uh, uh, if we go back to the post-war years, um, America took on a lot of debt uh, to finance businesses, uh, which were, or rather overseas businesses, who were then told you've got to use the loans that you've got from us to buy from us. And uh, that, but obviously at the end of the day, that did increase the US government's debt. And uh, we've had a huge acceleration in that in the last de uh, decade since 2008. 
Um, but the only way to pay off debt uh, in the United States now is more, with more debt. Now, that wasn't the situation, uh, wasn't the plan a decade ago. A decade ago, the plan was that they were going to gradually pay down the debt from, it was about 80% of GDP. They were going to pay it down to about 60% of GDP by now, 2023. And then another 10 or 20 years out, it was going to reach 0% of GDP. That was the plan a decade ago. But the, the plan has completely changed. The plan is to keep paying off debt by borrowing more and uh, and running more and more deficits by borrowing more. So the answer to the question from Philip Lewis is basically uh, the official plan is to pay off debt by borrowing more. It's a bit like someone with a credit card saying, I'll keep maxing out my credit card. And when they won't lend me anymore, I'll take out another credit card and borrow and, and I'll borrow, I'll keep borrowing that uh, sad as it seems, that is the plan. It's not sustainable in the long term, um, but uh, they just hope they can keep the game going for, for as long as possible. Yeah, just before I let you answer that, Andrea, I wanted to say I think the end game, because you asked what's the end game, I think the end game is the people who control this system, uh, they, they, they buy as much uh, assets, real assets and productive assets as possible and uh you and i and the general public get left holding the bag i.e the devalued dollars i think that's the end game too so they own everything and we own almost nothing so i'll let you answer that uh, andre now well uh the way i see it uh with this debt-based fiat currency system is They've been getting away with this by keeping inflation relatively low, which means you, they're stealing from us, except uh, not at a very strong pace. So we might as well, you know, find a way to, to protect ourselves from it. Uh, then you have technology and lots of things that be, give us a lot of productivity, and that is deflationary. They started... Uh, calculating CPI by increasing uh, those tech uh, advances into the metrics and trying to exclude what we need need to live, like recently cars, uh, housing, uh, food and energy, because it's too volatile, so they get rid of that. So that can keep bond yields low. That's a, a subtle form of uh, financial repression. And then from time to time, they would restrain a little bit on the fiscal side. They would enjoy some deflationary forces other than tech, like you mentioned, uh, China joining uh, the World uh, uh, Commerce Organization, uh, the, the World Organization for Trade, World Trade Organization. But once they decided to do what they did after COVID, uh, it became a mathematical certainty that anyone who wants to see cannot unsee. So now there's not enough productivity, there's not enough uh, technological breakthrough, uh, there's not enough uh, fiscal restraint that can fix this thing. So what the end game would be, uh, a lot of people say that unless we get a huge uh, productivity breakthrough uh, that would allow us to uh, grow our ways out of this mountain of debt, there's no other way they're going to have to print, and they will print. They're not going to default. The base layer of the, the base layer of all fiat currencies in the world is the U.S. Treasury bond market. So for them not to print is not an option. They're they're just trying to delay this as much as they can. Uh, I think what they hope for is to something break. They're going to try to plug in the banks, whichever way they can, and keep rates high until. The economy is so weak that they can start printing and don't have immediate inflationary effects right off the bat, which eventually they will have. You know, if you look at the 70s, uh, inflation in the 70s, it came in waves. It came in waves. It, it looks a lot like that nowadays. I think we're going to, they're going to try to plug the banks uh, because if they don't plug the banks and start printing right now, uh, inflation is going to run through the roof. But so they're going to try to plug the banks. They're going to keep rates higher. Uh, you know, other currencies are going to get on their knees to the dollar. I think the dollars has the potential to destroy the yen, the euro. They don't care. They want their reserve currency status. They don't care about their allies. They're going to destroy these currencies because they need to. 
And once they need to really start lowering rates, I, I guess they will do that when the U.S. is under a deep Main Street recession. The problem I see, just to finish it off, because of this mathematical certainty, what's, what's ironic about it is that equity markets noticed it. They know they will have to print. So nobody sells. Markets keeps going up. We have, a, I think Clive called it correctly, we have a melt-up, period. So this is not your typical cycle because they have such certainty that you know they will print that people don't even bother. They want to be in the stocks that are productive, mm -hmm. the likes of Apple, Amazon, Tesla, those tech stocks that you know uh, that you know have productivity that can better survive what's coming, lose less by holding Apple than holding T bills. Understand? That's how I see it. Yeah. It's a melt up. Yeah, and that's I. I, I, I I think that's the message. If you hold something other than cash, bonds, or T-bills, you will lose less. And whether it's equities or gold or tangible assets like property, uh, yeah, when, when they have this collapse in currencies, uh, that's a wealth destruction event. So everything has to be worth less after a wealth destruction event, but you'll still own it. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, the dollar uh, right now is going down a little bit as per the dollar index but like you said um and i've said it as well you know the dollar is still the top uh reserve currency but eventually uh, the dollar the euro and all the other fiat currencies they might be moving against each other but it will be gold and silver that are gonna like devalue them because you can't devalue the dollar versus the euro because Americans start devaluing the dollar. Then the ECB will come and cut rates. And it's like a, so the only way is through, uh, I think gold, because gold is like a, it's a neutral. It's not, it doesn't have, it doesn't play politics. Um, and um, what else? Oh yeah. Just wanted to let you know, uh, um, uh, Andre, uh, in regards to Brazil, they asked, you know, would you welcome Lula to your inauguration? He said, because Lula is a socialist and this guy is like the complete opposite. And he said, well, uh, Lula is the president of Brazil. So, yeah, he's, you know, he should come. So I think he's reasonable, uh, this guy, Millet. And the other thing he said is about uh, on December 11th, because that's the day after he's inaugurated that uh, he's going to stop all public public sector works and they asked him you know so what who's going to do that work and he said well if uh, the private sector <laughs> if it's worth the uh, the private sector to come and do that then they'll do it if it's not then uh, it's not going to be done I, I thought that was quite a good um, answer the other thing he said is he going to privatize all public companies or, or government owned companies. And they asked again, well, what, it, you know, how can you do that? And he said, well, if there are businesses that are worth running, the private sector is going to buy them. And the other thing he, 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 he uh, noted, uh, he said he had a chat with the Pope, not that I care much about the Pope, but he said that uh, Argentinians are mostly Catholic and he respects that. So just wanted to put that out there. And we've got another super chat from Philip Lewis. Thank you, Philip. Um, he says the use of debt assumes an ethical framework by society to pay back debt. Society is not ethical at this time. People just file bankruptcy and countries make new currencies. No wonder why credit default swaps are so popular. Well, I agree with that. You know, there's a really good book by uh, Edward Chancellor. Uh, I think it's called The Price of Time. And I really recommend that. You know, that's been a, a question about interest and usury has been, a you know, a long There's been thousands of years people have been asking this question. How do you guys feel about that? Um, I, I saw, a, I, I've seen quite a few uh, videos in the recent weeks where people are just shrugging their shoulders and walking away from debt. Uh, it, now, the, the one I saw today happened to be a guy in China, um, nothing to do with America, but uh, basically he 
bought a bought a flat, couldn't afford to pay for it, and uh, basically said, "I've declared bankruptcy." Um, but I think this is going on all over the world now. And it's uh, as you say, it's not uh, it's, as uh, Philip says, it's not just the individuals who are walking away from their debt and declaring bankruptcy with little or no consequences after that. Um, we also have the situation where countries. Um, historically have done it. We've had a quite a long lapse of years when we haven't had any major country bankruptcies uh, recently, but I've got a feeling that there's um, a number coming. Uh, as Andre says, it won't be the United States. They're not, they're not going to default, uh, but you will be still a loser if you hold their dollars or their treasury bills. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think some of the countries which don't, the countries which borrow dollars, uh, there's a bit, there's a risk of default at the moment. Yeah, and I think, you know, what Philip said there, um, you know, uh, the way countries, especially like the U.S., the way they uh, default is through inflating. I mean, uh, inflation is a kind of default, and it's an ongoing default. Uh, uh, Andre, anything to add on that uh, comment by Philip? I have a couple of uh, things to comment. One, uh, to Clive's point, uh, there are some rumor mills that they know what the U.S. Fed is up to. They're going to raise rates to the roof, call those dollars home, bankrupt everybody. But then again, the counteraction to that is BRICS Plus, trading in gold back yuans and barters of sorts. So some people say that if this arrangement for the BRICS Plus becomes uh, well-organized, they might as well default on these U.S. dollar obligations. So that, that's not off the table. You could be there could be a, a huge amount of dollar defaults because they just don't have the dollars and they're going to go on with their lives uh, in, a, in a reset of sorts where they're going to get what they need from from Russia. They're going to buy what they need from from the manufacturing in China. So if you think about it, Brazil, uh, a commodity powerhouse, together with Russia, a commodity and energy powerhouse, together with uh, China, a manufacturing powerhouse. If you align with these guys, it's quite tempting to default on your dollar obligations, you know, because these dollar obligations, like it or not, the source of these obligations is the fiat currency system. You know, the weaponization of the dollar to enslave these countries at the expense of some corrupt uh, puppet politicians. So there's, all, you know, there's yeah. a lot of uh, reasons for you to default uh, on these dollar debts uh, without too much remorse. You understand yeah. my point? So yeah. this is on the radar. One other thing that I would like to tell uh, your your super chat. What's his name? Philippe Luis? Uh, Philippe Luis? Uh, Lewis. Philippe Lewis. Uh, one thing I'd like to tell him is that I have a philosophical view about this money issue. Because I think about fiat currency where anyone at zero cost can print and steal your time and your, and your energy from you, your children, without effort, uh, is ungodly. And once you can debase one's energy and one's time, which is all we got, we don't have anything in this world other than our time and our energy. So once you can steal that away from us at will, the incentives become inverted. Why am I going to work? Why am I going to pay my bills? Why, I gonna, why am I going to be an honest citizen? Because you steal all the money and you pour this money in the wrong places. Yeah. So you start seeing teachers making low wages and I don't know, some kind of weird people making a ton of money because, and then the culture becomes the norm and that all hell breaks loose. So yeah. I have a very strong opinion about ungodly money, which is yeah. to me, that's what fiat currencies is. I, I'm sorry to go down, down no, that that's route. A, no, I, I, have to I don't mind. No, I, I agree with you. And the other thing I would say under a fiat currency system, uh, people, uh, you know, the money, the, Fiat money is so plentiful that people use it, lend it, and borrow it just to buy things. It's not a productive loan like uh, under a sound money system or a godly system, if you want to call it. You know, uh, let's say a farmer needs uh, a loan so he can buy the seeds to plant, and then he can pay back. In you know, he'll have a he plant and he will have a return and he can pay back the loan and everyone's better off. 
But what we've had, especially, you know, since the uh, 90s, is uh, a complete financialization of the system. And uh, it's completely, you know, that's why I always get a little bit, you know, skeptical about people who go on about, I'm not saying AI is bad or technology is bad, but we've had so much fiat currency finance all this that I think it's time to rebalance things. And I'm not saying we should rebalance it, just let the market do it. But anyway, we've got another <laughs> uh, generous super chat from Philippe. Uh, he says, in the past, some countries tried to price tried price controls to stave off inflation. It did not work. I, I agree, Philip. That never works. It actually has the opposite effect because when you put price controls, producers, they stop producing because a lot of times uh, it's not worth for them to sell at those uh, prices. And that actually, you know, that creates shortages. Clive? Well, we had uh, wage and price controls many times in the UK. Um, uh, I think uh, 1948 to 53, there was a uh, wage and price control. And then uh, it wasn't under, probably under Wilson as well, uh, which, which would be the 1960s. They brought in the wage and price controls and tried to stop prices rising. Um, and at one point, I seem to recollect, uh, they even issued us all with ration coupons. We never got to use them. Uh, but the reason they were doing that was because shortages were starting to appear. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So uh, I'll let you uh, finish off, uh, Phil, uh, Andre. Any question? Any comments on the uh, price controls? Well, price controls are nothing but a, a blame game, right? Now they're they're blaming inflation on climate change. <laughs> Lagarde came yes. out. <laughs> the snake faced Lagarde had their nerve to say that. Yeah. I mean, what can I tell you? No comment. Yeah, it's a blame okay. game. It's and it's quite. I I find it quite insulting, to be honest. You know. Yeah. Any. Uh, so we're gonna wrap up because we we've been over an hour. So, uh, Andre, any final uh, comments to the viewers about uh, what do you think is gonna happen in Argentina and also in general about things? And then Clive. Well, I think Argentina has the right man at the right time uh, yet to be seen. Why do I say that? You have a currency crisis. Argentina debased its currency, so it, it, it has a, a decent starting point as far as debt to GDP is concerned, as they do, de dollarized, as they dollarized, I'm sorry. They have a, a lot of hard assets, so if free market forces are allowed to to come to play in Argentina, they, they might get some initial help from, from the likes of the IMF. But once uh, direct investment investments starts pouring in, uh, they're going to be in a great position. Like uh, one of your viewers mentioned, or I think you mentioned, yeah, it might be a good place to go and live uh, sometime in the near future under the circumstances. Clive? Um, I'm hearing a lot of good things about the way things could go in Argentina. And <laughs> I certainly think it will suck. Uh, uh, if it goes right, which I think there's a reasonable chance it will, it will suck in a lot of international businesses who want to do business in Argentina. Uh, so that could be very good. And of course, the uh, uh, the United States is going to love to have uh, a pro uh, democracy, pro capitalism uh, society in South America. Uh, so I think the, the they'll be quite supportive of it. Um, the the other thing I know, Barry, obviously you show you're a you're a gold man, and I just like to say that I, on the gold price, I've been watching it for many many decades. And I have to say, I feel it now pumping up uh, against this sort of two thousand dollar barrel uh, barrier. Uh, will it go through it? It's I, I saw last night. It was two uh, Friday night. It was two thousand and two. I was just looking at my screen up above there. Um, it it it. It, it's looking uh, like it's trying to get higher, but someone out there is trying to push it back. Don't you think so, yeah. Mario? Yeah, I, I mean, it, uh, I was talking to, uh, I think it was Andre before you came on, that uh, if we close, or someone else actually called me today, it wasn't any of you, I, I said that if we're able to close this month above 2,000, it would be the first time ever it closes about 2,000. So I think this next week will be important. But eventually, I think it will blow right through that level. But you just have to be patient. 
Yeah, but it's uh, looking... may, may, may I add context to that? Yeah. One, one of my theories is that because of the gold, uh, China's appetite for gold, uh, and, and gold is literally coming from west to east, uh, that is one of the reasons gold is still at 2000 uh, and not lower, because it's not very difficult for them to manipulate the gold paper, the gold, uh, paper gold markets. That being said, uh, here's a catch-22 for Western economies. Uh, they want to keep uh, this farce about gold price so people don't understand what's going on with the fiat currency. While they keep this party going, China is going to suck up all this gold on the cheap. So they're just delaying uh, the unavoidable. And once that happens, imagine if you take this uh, into infinity, all the gold in the world is going to end up in China. They're going to convert into gold and they're going to rule the world. If this thing stays for eternity, that's what's going to happen. So yeah, these they people don't know what they're, they, yeah. they, they don't know what they're doing, Mario. Yeah, because there's that old stuck. saying, isn't it? He who has the gold makes the rules, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but but they cannot allow gold to run away right now. So China knows it, and she's China is sucking up all the gold yeah. on the cheap. Yeah, yeah. They're going to rule the financial uh, system. I saw Singapore is loading up as well. Even Poland. Uh, it's too bad the UK isn't loading up. Uh, but uh... I, I, I said about this, uh, sorry to interrupt, China will literally own Western Europe with this. You understand? That's what's going to happen. They're going to have all the gold, even from Western Europe, this gold is going to end up in yeah, China. Unfortunately, our, yeah, our leaders don't understand gold, do they? How important it is. Uh, that's the uh, bad thing. But um, at least we 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 can uh, like uh, piggyback off China then. <laughs> well, right. when the time is right, China is going to call the cards and Go is going to rock it. Yeah, because well, a geopolitically yeah. makes all of the you know makes a ton of sense for China to play that card. Bob. They will. Uh, Bob, uh, thank you for the super chat. Bob says the age of the dollar is over. The time of commodities has come. So there you go. We're going to end on that. And I'm going to thank uh, Andre and Clive for coming on. It was really nice of you guys to share your wisdom with me and the viewers. And uh, we wish you a great week. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Clive. Bye-bye, uh, Andre. Bye-bye, Mario. Bye. Uh, hi, guys.